Thank you for joining us. Um, we are looking at what's in the Bible, and tonight we will start part one of two of the New Testament. Um, we obviously will finish the New Testament in the next um, lesson, not not on Mother's Day, but the week after. So um, at the end of the Old Testament, from the New Testament, is a period of time called the 400 years of silence. This is a time when, when there's no new revelation being given, and it's just kind of a, a period of waiting where nothing really is happening as far as, um, you know, God's redemption story. It's just kind of, you know, in a limbo, for lack of a better word. Uh, and so when we're talking about testament, the word testament, it basically means covenant. So everything in the, in the New Testament is everything after Jesus came, and everything in the Old Testament is before Jesus came. So the Old Testament is going to look forward, the New Testament looks back um, on, obviously, on Jesus. Uh, so uh, the New Testament being the, the, the time when God's people are under a, a new covenant as opposed to the old covenant the, that the Israelites were under. Um, nothing in the New Testament, though, um, needs to be tweaked. Okay? For instance, okay, the Holy Spirit being given was after, uh, after Jesus, for instance. And that doesn't change Jesus' teachings. So sometimes people think that somehow the things in the New Testament needs, need to be kind of changed a little bit in reality to the Holy Spirit being given. And that's just not really a thing. You see, the, the books uh, of the New Testament that were written were written after the Holy Spirit had been given uh, to the church. And so, no, they did not need to have uh, further, um, they don't need to be seen in a different light as far as the Holy Spirit coming. It didn't change anything. When, when Jesus said, when, where two or three are gathered, uh, the, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit doesn't change that. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, that the Holy Spirit didn't change that. God has created structure and order. When you read 1 Corinthians and Paul's giving instructions to the church, that none of that has to be um, understood in a different light because the Holy Spirit was given. Um, everything in the New Testament was written after the Holy Spirit had already been given. So, also, uh, there, there is no need for, for, for new revelation to alter. This is something that cults do quite a lot, is they try to tweak and, 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 and change the New Testament uh, because of some supposed new revelation. And you, you have everything from Islamic to Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism. I mean, there's just so many different examples of um, people thinking that there needs to be more revelation that, that, that changes things. And it can be in charismatic circles or just in, in different kind of religious groups. Um, the Old Testament does have to be reinterpreted, as we've look, been looking at, uh, but the New Testament also has to be kind of reinterpreted in light of our current context. And what I mean by that is um, it, no situation from the Bible is going to directly apply. apply. Um, so we don't, have, we don't have to modify the Bible, but we do have to study it, understand it then, and then bring that over into our current situation and apply it to here today. Nothing that you read in the Bible is going to be a direct one-for-one -one equivalent. And that goes to the Old Testament and the New Testament. You don't just read a passage and say, I don't really understand what's going on here, but it seems like this is how it applies to my situation. That's just not how you have to understand it in its context first. Um, we do absolutely still have to study it in its context, but we, we don't have to modify it. So I hope that that kind of makes sense. So if you remember, a lot of uh, the Old Testament was under, you know, the, the Syrians and the Babylonians and then the Persians. So Greek, the Greeks came through in the 300s and, and conquered over the Persians. And they ruled over the land of the Promised Land. Um, so they had been Israel had been under the Persia, then they were under Greece. Uh, then they had their Hasmonean dynasty, and then the Hasmonean dynasty pretty much ended with the uh, Romans coming through. Um, I want to say it was like 63 BC or something like that, and conquered from there or controlling it from there. So then we can get to um, we're going to look at the New Testament in chronological order. The first book um, written is more than likely James. It's likely the first uh, New Testament book written. Uh, it was written quite possibly as early as the 40s, but maybe also the 50s, uh, somewhere in that general range there. It was written by Jesus' brother, James. Uh, and it, it, the interesting thing about Jesus' brothers, uh, we're going to look at one more of his brother than in the next book, but it, it appears as though neither, neither of them believed until after the resurrection. Um, I know sometimes... Uh, we don't get a whole lot of support in the endeavors that we do, and I, I think that Jesus was very familiar with that. Um, and he was a lot more important than, you know, one of our endeavors. 
Um, so, okay, uh, the new, uh, James has been called the New Testament book of Proverbs. And if, as you read through it, you could definitely see that. Uh, it, it's got a lot of, it, it seems like disconnected Proverbs about life, um, but they are connected and there is definitely a theme going on. It's just harder to get. And the reason for that is because the, James didn't use the standard format uh, of writing because Paul's uh, Paul hadn't written his letters yet, so there was no standard writing yet. Uh, so he was writing a book that really didn't have a whole lot of uh, examples for him to lean onto. Uh, James does not teach salvation by works. A lot of times when people read the book of James, they think that he's saying salvation is by works, especially in light of Paul's writings, where Paul talks a lot about you know not not earning our salvation, all these different things like in Ephesians and stuff, but. James isn't actually teaching salvation by works. What he's teaching is that true salvation produces works. And this is really the same thing that Paul says. It's just it worded in a different way. And sometimes that can get a little bit confusing. Now, the structure of the book is, is, is hard, to, hard to kind of uh, follow. It's hard to discern. Um, and part of that is because the verses don't seem like they're connected. Uh, it kind of seems like he's hopping around, which is, once again, why I got the idea of a, of a New Testament Proverbs. But it's just a creative way of writing, let's just say like that. He uses catch words throughout the book to progress the topics. Like he'll say a word, and then he'll use that word in the next sentence to kind of carry over to a different, um, a different uh, sentence. You get what I'm saying? A different kind of thought. And so for that reason, it kind of seems like it's a, it's a bit of a grasshopper jumping everywhere. But if you, if you kind of step back and look at the book, you, you, it, there's three main themes that really hop out. The first one is trials. The book starts out with it, and then it goes to the next, next uh, uh, theme, which is speech or wisdom, where those kind of two thoughts combined in the book of James. And then the third theme is between the rich and the poor, and it'll hop between these three things and um, kind of stick with one and kind of use catchwords to go to the next theme. Unlike that. And as you kind of look at James, try to just step back and you can kind of see how this plays out. Uh, but it is, is definitely going to be something that's not going to come as easy to study as a book like um, Mark or Thessalonians. <laughs> but uh, definitely it is, it is a really good book, obviously. Um, it is written to Jewish Christian day laborers, largely in the area of uh, Syria. Um, it is uh, very much so re uh, reflective of that. You can read through and kind of see how it would apply to that. And, and there's an interesting kind of thing. As I'm telling you who the book is written to, as you're reading it, pretend like you're that group of people or person, uh, especially when you get to like books like Philemon. And it, it's just really interesting how it kind of connects there. So, so what? What does it matter that James is a part of our Bible? James offers an Old Testament flavor of writing giving practical wisdom in an un-Pauline way. And what I mean by that is, is he's writing in a way that's not Paul, uh, which is kind of ref kind of uh, refreshing in a way. Uh, the next book of the New Testament, um, in chronological order, would probably be Jude. Um, it's quoted very largely in 2 Peter. Uh, 2 Peter 2 is pretty much the book of Jude. Um, it was written either in the 40s, 50s, or 60s, somewhere in that range there. Um, it's written to an unspecified congregation or congregations, possibly dispersed throughout the empire. We don't really know. Uh, there's really not a whole lot in the book that clarifies. It was written by Jesus' brother, Jude, or Judas. <laughs> uh, Judas. Uh, not the same Judas <laughs> that betrayed him, though. Um, once again, Jude was probably not, uh, not saved until after uh, the resurrection. <coughs> now, in the book of Jude, there's this kind of confusing thing that happens that sometimes kind of catches people off guard. He references other books, like Jewish religious books, for instance, that are not part of our Christian Bible canon. They're not part. They're not in our in our Bible. And sometimes people think, well, does that mean that that book was supposed to be in our Bible? Well, here's the thing: it doesn't mean that those books are inspired by God. He's just kind of citing something that everyone knows. Like if I reference Lord of the Rings, I'm not saying Lord of the Rings is scripture. Uh, I'm just, you know, using it as an example. And that's kind of exactly what's happening with Jude here. Um, he, he's referencing books that the Jews would know, but that doesn't mean he's saying that they are scripture or that they should be. So what, what does it matter about Jude? Well, Satan is always trying to sneak into the church. And I think that, the, that that's something that we kind of don't give Jude the attention that it deserves. Um, but it does definitely have a message that's very, still very much so common uh, and necessary in the church. The third book is uh, more than likely Mark. Uh, this is the oldest of the Gospels. 
um, the very first gospel written. Matthew and Luke both largely depend on it um, as, as, as a source. Uh, they do use other sources, but they do largely depend on Mark. Um, th these three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the idea here is that they have a lot of similarities between them. Um, John, John would be the, obviously the odd duck out there. Um, it's written by, uh, kind of like, it's kind of written by Peter, kind of written by Mark. Uh, it seems as though uh, Peter, it was Peter's version, but Mark was the one who was actually doing the writing of it. So think of like Peter kind of telling Mark what to, what to write. And that, that appears to be what's happening there. Now, um, some people think that they think that Mark kind of is inserts himself into the story. Like, for instance, towards the end, where there's the the guy that's running uh, doesn't ever give a name. That that's Mark. It's possible, but once again, it's, it's not something that, that we know objectively. You know, this is what it is. Um, Mark is a very interesting uh, book. It gives a lot of adjectives, uh, even where other the other gospels don't. Like, uh, whereas. Maybe one of the other Gospels would say they sat down on the grass. Mark will say on the green grass. Uh, it, but with all with these uh, added adjectives, it's still the shortest Gospel. Um, it it kind of has an urgency to it. Uh, kind of has it seems like it's going from thing to thing, kind of hopping through it, kind of quick. Um, and it's written with these verbs that kind of carry a lot of action. Uh, we 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 went here. We go here. You know, kind of moving things forward. And, and it definitely has has a for especially for its size a lot of things that's happening in a very short period of time it was probably written uh in the 50s maybe in the 60s possibly um written to to gentiles it seems extremely obvious uh in one way it seems obvious is because uh he explain he takes time to explain things throughout the book so like he'll go and he'll say this and i'll say now this means that like he'll give a little explanation uh and this wouldn't really make sense if he were writing to a jewish uh congregation so the audience it's what seems likely from the audience is that they're possibly Roman. Uh, here's the thing. In, in Rome in the 40s, uh, there was a little bit of a thing that happened there where the, where the Christians were, uh, I should say the, the, the Jews, uh, were kicked out of Rome. This was in the 40s, and they didn't return until the 50s. And really there was, there was kind of a complicated history that was happening in, in Rome uh, with, the, with the Christians um, and the Jews. So... Uh, it seems like these are people who had been out of Rome, but then now had come back. So he's writing to 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 Roman believers who had been kicked out of Rome. Uh, maybe they had returned at this point. Maybe they hadn't. It's kind of unclear. Uh, the themes in the book, though, in this gospel are that, first off, Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, it starts out right out the gate, uh, quoting a passage from the Old Testament that equates Jesus as Yahweh. Um Actions of Jesus uh, are, are really emphasized, whereas Matthew follows more of the words of Jesus. Uh, that's not don't don't look at that too dogmatically, but that's just something to kind of help you see how the book flows itself out. Um, Jesus is, is shown as a servant. You know, all these things, very important things. Uh, the, the book itself has three different endings. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've noticed it in your Bible. The the one that was probably the original one is the one that ended with they were all scared and ran away. Um, it just kind of seems to fit the theme of Mark a little bit better than the other ones do, and I and I think that the other two were probably just added afterwards. By the way, we have three different endings, and they're not all in all the manuscripts. So uh, Paul and Mark uh, had a falling out, as is recorded in uh, Acts. Uh, there was an issue where you know Paul didn't think that Mark was uh, going to run the race, and so he didn't really want to want to fool with it. Uh, and I think it was Paul and. Uh, Barnabas, if I remember correctly, they get in a little bit of a fight about it, and there's a little bit of falling out, and, and, and Paul and Mark, you know, kind of estranged there. Uh, but near the end of Paul's life, I believe it's in 2 Timothy, he mentions about how Mark is useful to him, and uh, it, it appears as though they have been reconciled and, and things have, have worked out. I don't know how long that took, though. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, the Gospels themselves are not exact quotes. You should not be looking at them as exact quotes. Uh, nor do the Gospels measure up to our current standards of, uh, you know, a, a biography, okay? Um, but they fit how things were written back then. They get the gist of what Jesus says, and they do live up to the standards of how things were written back then. But keep in mind that the Gospels weren't written primarily just to record a person's life. They were recording a person's life for a reason, so all the Gospels, though, follow, a similar, uh, follow similar outlines, uh, more or less. But to break down each of the Gospels into an outline uh, would take a 
bit too long. Um, so, I mean, you've got Jesus' ministry leading up to his uh, crucifixion and then resurrection. That's the basic idea there. To break down each of the Gospels, it, it, that just that would just take an excessively long amount of time, and, and that would eat up this class time. So in about 150, uh, Tatian tried to make a single Gospel out of the four Gospels to get rid of the differences and seeming con- contradictions and discrepancies and make one single uh, Gospel. It was... It, but they, they, they realized that it was the, diff- the differences that made uh, that make each of the Gospels important and unique, uh, and they didn't want to get rid of that. Um, I know it's oftentimes seen as contradictions in the Gospels nowadays, but they can easily be answered um, if you don't rush to the decision and to the conclusion that there are uh, contradictions. So there's, there's a lot of value in each of them, and, and yes, they are different, and they do have differences, and it seems like they contradict each other. This is very important, because when you're reading them, you have to step back and take it for what it is, and then kind of weigh them against each other, and uh, uh, most of the time, um, solutions present themselves. But it, when they don't, you can always ask it in the question box. Now, Mark has something called the messianic secret, um, and this is really key throughout the whole book. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. And just to kind of clarify what I mean by messianic secret, this is where Jesus will say, no, don't go and tell somebody that I'm Messiah. Don't go and tell them what I did. Um, There's a lot of different reasons why he does it, but um, we're not really going to look too much into that. Like, let's say a demon will say, hey, you're the Christ, and he'll say, no, don't, be quiet. Well, obviously, he doesn't want demons testifying about him. Uh, Then sometimes it was simply a matter of, you know, there would be too large of a crowd. Uh, but either way, for for all the different reasons that he tells people to be quiet, that's a main theme in, in Mark. Um, so what? What does it matter that, that Mark is a part of our Bible? Why do we need this gospel when we already have other gospels? Um, because Mark uh, really, out of all the gospels, I think, it really applies the most to a specific situation where loss isn't all that bad for Christians. Remember, these are these are Christians who have suffered, who have lost, uh, and, you know, they, they have gone through some very difficult times, uh, in, at least in part because of their faith in Christ. Um, obviously, there were things that were happening in the empire anyways, but being a Christian didn't help it. <laughs> it didn't help that at all. So, you know, yes, Mark, even more so than the other Gospels, is very much so uh, driven with, uh, with an agenda to, um, to help Christians who are just really, um, really bad off. And it kind of gives them hope and encouragement. So the next book uh, is Galatians, which it might have been an earlier book depending on uh, uh, when Mark was actually written. So if Mark was written in, you know, the 50s or the 60s, then obviously it was after Galatians. But if it was before, then obviously before. So (laughs) when we're looking at what are called the epistles, which is a fancy word for letters, uh, we look through the Bible and we say, okay, why are they ordered in this way? Now, I have no idea why the Gospels are ordered in the, in the way that they are. I have no idea. Uh, Mark is the shortest. I'm not sure if John is the longest. I think Luke is probably the longest. I'm not sure. So I don't know why that, those are ordered in the way that they are. But then when we get to Paul's letters, the, what are, what's called the epistles, um, they're organized in the Bible from long to short, according to churches, and then uh, letters that he wrote to people, long to short. So obviously it would be Romans and First and Second Corinthians, see so on and on like that until you get down to the books that were written to actual people, and then you have you know First and Second Timothy and all that, and then you get to what are called the general epistles. These are these are uh, letters not necessarily written to people generally, <laughs> uh, but yeah, written to people um, just uh, maybe not to a specific uh, group. But let's like here's a good example of uh, the book of Hebrews, probably more than just one church, much like Corinthians is to one church. It's kind of like general, it goes to more general groups, but also sometimes it can be written by more general people. For instance, Hebrews, we don't really know who wrote that one. So that's a good example of, of how it can be either. But the idea is that it was not to a specific church like first and second Corinthians, but it was to a general area such as um you know, uh, the churches in, in Turkey, for instance. Now, um, and then Revelation is at the end, um, just because it, it, it deals with things in the future, and that kind of seems like a good place to put it. Galatians was written in the 40s, but sometime, probably sometime before the council from Acts chapter 15, the, the Jerusalem council, which means that it was probably written in 48. Um, it was written by Paul, um, who was not one of Jesus' disciples, 
Um, he actually didn't even get saved until uh, St after Stephen was was martyred in, in Jerusalem. So this was after the Holy Spirit had been given, after all that. So the main theme of Galatians is, is separation from the Judaizers, uh, or maybe you could say the main theme is Christian freedom. Judaizers are a group of people who thought works of law plus faith in Christ meant justification, whereas Paul taught faith in Christ uh, equals justification and works of the Spirit. So the idea here is Judaizers thought that they needed to add being a Jew or doing the work, doing good things or doing the law to be saved. Um, a modern group of this would, would maybe sometimes be Messianic Jews who, who think that, you know, Jesus, but also the law. Um, now, Galatians, I know I just said that these first books are written to specific churches, but Galatia was actually an area of Rome, not a town. So it would be more of the churches of Galatia, not the church in, in Galatia. Like, there, it's not one single church. Um, and how the, how the churches were kind of organized back then is there were a series of, of uh, churches for a town. So the church in Rome would be a series of house churches. Um, there was organization, absolutely, there was leadership, but it, it, it didn't have like a singular building a lot of times. And whereas they used to use the synagogues when they were largely Jews, um, that changed with more and more Gentiles. And then also it changed because they, weren't, they were kind of run out of uh, the synagogue. So, so that quickly changed and they had to go to house churches. How do we know if something is against the law of Christ like Galatians talks about? Well, some things are preferences. This can be like, um, I don't like... Uh, let's say, uh, nonfiction books. There, there's a good, let's, now, that's not true, but let's just say, I don't like, not, it's, there's nothing wrong with them, I just don't like them, right? That's my preference. But then some things are personal convictions. These are things that you feel convicted about. They're wrong to you. In, in, in the time of Paul, this would have been like, for instance, eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. It wasn't wrong, but if you had a problem with it, then it was wrong. And, you know, and he's just kind of, well, you know, the, the, the brother who's easily offended is the brother who's weaker, who's more immature. And so the more mature people need to watch out for the more immature people. Um, and the same thing is true for now. Uh, people, a lot of Christians get uh, kind of, you know, they each have their own thing that's, that uh, bothers them. And that's fine. Uh, but the, pro the real important thing is it's not your job to impress your convictions on somebody else, just like it's not their job to put their convictions on you. It's not my job as a pastor to, to teach you my convictions, my personal convictions. It's my job to live out my convictions and help you in your convictions. Um, there's a lot of things that I feel a certain way about that other people don't uh, agree with me on, and I just had to let that go. Um, I remember I was at one church, and they were talking about uh, fantasy books. And there was uh, this one guy who I was talking to, and he said, you know, I, I used to uh, read fantasy books, and there were these pastors that, that made, you know, told me that, that I shouldn't because of, you know, fantasy is evil and all this different stuff. And he said, why is it evil? It's got the same things that, that the Bible has in it, um, but these things aren't real. Like, this isn't really how, you know, spells are and how witches are and all these different things. And I remember listening to that, I remember thinking, huh, well, I didn't really think about that. Uh, if we had as, as harsh as, of requirements um, on... Uh, on the Bible as we do on fantasy books. I don't think the Bible would qualify to, to be read. But my more of the story being that's, that would be something that is a personal conviction. I don't have to try and get people to, to start reading fantasy if they think that it's wrong. Like, if that's your personal conviction, live it out, right? I know a lot of people have, a, as a personal conviction, no alcohol whatsoever. That's fine. That's fine. Um, I am personally of the mindset that leadership probably shouldn't drink. Um, but if you are going to drink, that it should be in moderation, never in excess, uh, and probably stay away from the harder forms of alcohol. And you probably shouldn't drink just to drink. Uh, there should be, you know, kind of like more of a system to it. In, in my thinking, this is, once again, my own personal conviction. Nowhere in the Bible does, does, does Paul, for instance, write, uh, and Christians are to abstain from alcohol. I mean, the Jews didn't have to do that, and they were under the law. Um, I'm not trying to say you should go out and get drunk. That's not what I'm saying at all, especially in light of how it's going to impact other people who aren't saved. I think that absolutely has to be a, has to be a uh, something that you think about. But also, it's something that is a personal conviction. I can't force you to do one way or another. Um, it's just a personal conviction, and that's fine. And then the other thing are things that are moral absolutes. These are things that you have to, uh, you cannot compromise. So... Um, not trying to earn your salvation with works. That's something you cannot compromise on. Works has to be through grace by faith. That's it. It can't be from anything else. Jesus is the only way. That, that's a moral absolute. 
But then personal convictions would be something more like, well, I think the Christian should be in church every time that the doors are open. Well, okay. I mean, that's fine if you feel like that, but you don't get to push that on everybody else. And this is actually something we see in our culture happening quite a bit um, between transgender groups, for instance. Um, you have to use my personal pronouns. It was like, well, um, you can believe that. If that's your conviction. That's fine, but you can't force that on somebody else. And it's the exact same thing with Christians in the church. We can't act like that where we're forcing people uh, to bend around our personal convictions. That's just, it's not realistic, uh, and it's not um, more spiritual. It's just, cause, it's just being more contentious and causing more problems. So the law of Christ isn't a rule book like Deuteronomy is. It's more of a lifestyle, a, a general concept. And in Galatians, he goes through things that, that are, you know, not contrary to, 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 to the law and, you know, kind of points us towards the law of Christ. But he doesn't ever say, and this is the rule of thumb. Like, there is no rule of thumb with the law of Christ. It's more something where the Holy Spirit works in your heart and, you know, brings you to the knowledge of things. But then there's some things that he doesn't have to bring you to the knowledge of, right? So like murdering is still wrong. He doesn't have to convict me of that. I hope that this is all making sense. So what, what does it matter that Galatians is in our Bible? Even today, many people try to impress the laws of the Old Testament on New Testament Christians. That's still a thing that happens today. And I think that Paul would definitely be writing a, tr writing a letter about that. Um, next up in the series is the books of Thessalonians, first and second. There's two of them. And the first book of Thessalonians is more like, hey, Jesus is coming. That's like the basic theme of it. Jesus is coming soon. But then St. Thessalonians is kind of like, uh, you guys misunderstood what I was saying, okay? He's not coming back that soon. Take it easy. Uh, and so the, it was written to the church in a city called Thessalonica, which was the largest city in Macedonia um, by Greece, if you know where that is. <laughs> I don't know how good your geography is. I don't know. Uh, and this was, this was a major port. Um, in Acts 17, uh, it, it records Paul's time there. Uh, he had to end up leaving because uh, because he was running out of town. Um, if if you want to read through Acts and follow along on this, some of this it kind of helps. Uh, it was written in in uh, so in Galatians we were talking about the Jerusalem Council. That's Acts 15. Here we're talking about Paul is on another missionary journey. I believe it's his second or his third. I say his second, and he goes in Acts 17 to uh, Thessalonica. So uh, it was written, uh, book one was written in about 50, 51. Book two was written in about 51, 52. Um, Silas uh, is still with Paul in the book. And um, it happened... Uh, Um, oh, as far as when it was written, it happened uh, around in Acts 18, uh, for, when Paul is in Corinth, is when he writes uh, the Thessalonian books. So it was written by Paul, obviously, I just said that. Uh, it, um, there's a lot of times in the New Testament where who wrote the book or what the situation is or, or different things are going to be argued very, very strongly, especially with who wrote the different books. But usually they can easily be explained. Um, it's just that there's a lot of contention. I want to bring that to your attention, but I don't really want to look at it too much because they just eat up time. Um, as far as the books of Thessalonians, so what? What does it matter that we have them in our Bible? Can't we just ignore them? Well, here's the thing. Um, it's very important that we don't get swept into every end times theory. And it doesn't matter if it's by someone like John Hagee or by anyone else. There's just so many different theories and they're always being thrown out. It's always the end of the world. There's always, this is, this is uh, you know, a sign from God. This is a sign. The blood moons this and the e eclipses this. And there's just so many different things. It's very important that we're not swept in by all these different things. And Thessalonians, I think, is a good, uh, uh, a good ser uh, not sermon, but a good lesson on that. Um, we should have a more balanced view, and the books of Thessalonians give us that. Um, it's severely lacking. That kind of idea is severely lacking in today's extremism. I mean, everything has to be either or. You know, either you're Republican or you're Democrat. Either you, you know, you're a good, you're a good Christian that never misses, and you have your act together, or you're an atheist. It's like you can't be a Christian that's struggling. <laughs> um, but the books of Thessalonians are not like Revelation, even though they talk about the end times quite a bit. Uh, they're not like Revelation. They're more of an applicational look at the end times and how that impacts how the church should behave. So then that takes us to the books of Corinthians. Now, this is way complicated. I'm going to try and make it not complicated. Let me start with the basics. Uh, the, the city of Corinth, which is this, the, the church is, is in, in Corinth. This is Corinthians. They're from Corinth. This is in southern Greece. Uh, this is the largest city in Greece at that time. 
and it was very rich and very immoral. Kind of think of maybe New York. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. You kind of think about New York mixed with maybe Hollywood or something. I don't know. Uh, okay, so Paul <clears throat> Paul started this church in Corinth during his second missionary journey, uh, about which was from 49 to 52. So that's recorded in Acts chapter 18. Um, so now we're, I'm going to break down his... He had a very lengthy ongoing dialogue between them, okay? So let me try and make it easy. He went there first in 50-52, somewhere in there, okay? And then he wrote a letter, which we lost. We don't know where that letter is. And we also don't know why he wrote it. Uh, maybe there was some cause. I don't know. Either way, that letter was lost. They sent Paul or oral reports, so reports by word of mouth, and also a letter with questions while he was in Ephesus, which he was there for about three years. He wrote 1 Corinthians, which is actually, so that's 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians, okay? So he wrote 1 Corinthians to answer these questions that they had and in response to the oral reports that he got. They did not respond well to 1 Corinthians. So he visited them for a brief time. And then he sent another letter, which was very harsh, which we also do not have. And then the situation improved a little bit. And then he sent 2 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is actually 4 Corinthians. I know it's confusing, but if we number them uh, second and fourth in our Bibles, it would be very confusing because we wouldn't have a first, first or a third. So the first Corinthians was written in about 55, second in about 56-ish. Once again, these, these dates aren't exact. They're just to give you a general idea. Uh, the main theme of the, of the books, um, it was very much written to immature Christians um, who are very much so under threat to become like the culture around them and also uh, to compromise to the Judaizers like, uh, like in Galatians. They have very little order, and they're, they're experiencing... Um, charismatic things, so it moves of the Holy Spirit and stuff, but they don't have a strong direction. Everything is just kind of haywire. So there's dealing with a lot of chaotic, charismatic church stuff. Um, uh, also, And so you see that in the way that Paul's talking, like, hey, you guys need to stop being so offended by stuff, and you need to die to self. Like, y'all need Jesus. And uh, so uh, Corinth didn't understand um, body, and spirit. And this is this is a large part of the problem, um, which means that they went to one extreme called asceticism, which basically they were denying the humanity. So basically, uh, flesh evil, spirit good. Um, just kind of ignore your body needs and just overfocus on the spiritual. And you know, it, it, all those things don't really matter. You separation from the world and all these different things. And you definitely see that in the book. Uh, and then also another extremist view that they had, which is very much so contradictory, which is a big thing in, Cor in Corinth. They had a lot of factions. But this other contradictory view that was going on was called hedonism, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this. Uh, it's the overindulgence of the flesh. So instead of remaining aloof from the flesh and being kind of monk-like, this is the exact opposite. We're just indulging in all of it. So in Corinth had a lot of factions, there was a lot of disorder, very little unity whatsoever, and it caused a lot of problems. Um, and, you know, then you had a bunch of rich and titled people, and that really didn't help things either. Um, and 2 Corinthians was sent as Paul was leaving Ephesus, um, and then he met up with Titus, uh, and we'll stop by Corinth again in the third missionary journey. So uh, what is Cor what are the books of Corinthians matter? Why? Well, I honestly think the Corinthians, uh, first, first Corinthians at least, is probably, well, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it really does apply to the church today. So the church problems are nothing new, but they can be resolved and the church can grow again. When you look at Corinthians as appeared to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and we'll look at this in two weeks, but it shows the decline of the church. Um, in Ephesus. Whereas in Corinthians, you see them slowly coming around, but it just take, takes a lot of work. So, so yes, churches can start to grow again. They can get past um, and, and resolve different, different issues. Okay, so the next book to look at is the book of Romans. Um, Rome is obviously the capital of the empire. Um, so this is a book that's written to the, to the church and, and the empire's capital. Paul did not start this church. Uh, nor had he ever been there at the point that he wrote the book. Um, he wrote this in about 57, and as you read through Acts, about chapter 29, Paul is preparing to sell back to Syria, but then at the last minute he decides to go through Macedonia instead. Uh, 
And it's in that context that he writes Rome, writes to Rome, and he's got his eyes fixed out further east, uh, I'm sorry, further west, and uh, he plans to go out towards Spain, towards Rome. He plans all these different things, um, but there's a little bit of a hitch that comes up where he is um, arrested, but let's put a pen on that. So for five years at the end of Emperor Claudius's rule, the church in Rome was almost exclusively Gentile because the Jews had been uh, kicked out. So uh, Roman, the book, the book of Romans tries to rectify the differences between the Jews and, and, the, and the Gentiles and give a firm foundation for them moving forward. So it, for that reason, it reads a lot like a theology textbook. Uh, very hard to understand in parts. Uh, very, if you're new to the Bible, I would not recommend starting with this book. Uh, there's very little uh, situational cause. It's like the exact opposite of Corinthians. So in Corinthians, there's all these different things that are happening, and Paul's trying to address them all. In Romans, there's not like some big issue that's happening. He's just trying to bring unity to the church between the Jews and the Gentiles. That's, that's it. Um, there's not a whole lot of... Um, situational things. So what, what does it matter about Romans? Well, besides the fact uh, that it has the best theology breakdown of the entire Bible, uh, it is also very useful for evangelism, even if it's a little bit confusing. And what I mean by evangelism is our motivation for evangelism. It, it really um, gives Christians the, the, the encouragement uh, to witness to a dying and hurting world. That takes us to Luke Acts. Now, why I say Luke Acts is because Luke Acts was written together. There was Luke and Acts. These are like part is like a two parter, uh, part one and part two. The first is Luke. It's going to focus on Jesus. The second one is Acts. It's going to focus on the church. So it was written in about uh, Luke was written in about 60, 61, somewhere in there, while Paul was in prison in Rome, and then Acts was written in about 61, 62. So Luke had been traveling around with Paul quite a bit. Uh, and at the end of Acts, he's in prison. So Luke, in the meantime, is 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 writing these books um, while while Paul's in prison. So it was funded by a wealthy benefactor whose name was Theophilus. Uh, he gives reference to this gentleman in, at the beginning of both of the books. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we, there's not a whole lot we know about him, but it was probably wasn't written only for him. So it was written for him, but it was probably with the intention of going towards uh, Greek uh, Greek believers. So... It was written by Luke, who was not one of the first generation Christians. In fact, he was even he was even one of, one of the twelve. Uh, this is a second generation Christian. Uh, he was not there with personally, so he had to do a lot of research to find out what happened. Uh, he was a physician, a Gentile, uh, a companion to Paul, and, and Acts a lot of times to say says we did this, we went to this place. That's because Luke was with Paul. Uh, there's a strong emphasis throughout Luke and Acts on the poor and on the outcasts of society, uh, as well as on the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, with that, you see a, a lot more of a human side to Jesus than some of the other Gospels. So, so compassion for the outcasts the outcast is real big, be they women or Samaritans or sinners or whoever, the outcasts of society. Um, another thing that you see about Luke that's singular, uh, I, th I think we all get a bad bad idea of the Pharisees from like Matthew, for instance. But in Luke, the Pharisees are shown in a positive light. Um, Jesus is also shown as a as Savior in the book. Um it's interesting that, that Luke is, only, is one of only two Gospels that tell of Jesus' childhood. Mark says nothing about it. J Jesus, uh, John goes to Jesus' pre-incarnate uh, life, uh, reality, I guess you could say, how he was God before, and then hops straight forward uh, to, to John and then the ministry. He, he doesn't really say anything about the childhood. So you really only have Matthew and Luke that say anything about Jesus' childhood. And they both look at different aspects of Jesus' childhood, which once again seems like a contradiction, but you can very much so easily work that um, out. Acts follows Jesus' last words where he says, um, go be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and outward and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's exactly the, the model that the book of Acts follows. It goes out in that same thing. They go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria um, and outward to the ends of the earth. So the two books together, Luke and Acts, are, are, are a chiasm with the central event. The central event being Jesus' resurrection and ascension. So it starts out in the context of the empire, and, and it goes further and further and further with Luke uh, climaxing in Jerusalem. And then Acts starts in Jerusalem and goes out to the end, ends of the earth. Um, so you have that kind of chi chiasm, and so the central point of both the books, Luke and Acts, is Jesus' resurrection and ascension, not his death. Very important there. So, um, and there's more that could be said there about 
the early church mentality of of what was really important and and when they said things you know what they were what it all entailed so if they were talking about the resurrection of death of christ they would it would have been talking about the death and resurrection there's a lot of things like that we could talk about but we don't really have the time to really get into those things so i'm just going to move on um, there are a lot of smaller themes that happen throughout the book. So like, there'll be par- uh, parables and stuff that are kind of organized together to get a, to get a main point across. Um, but there are so many of that that we couldn't realistically break that down either unless this was just a couple weeks that we were looking at Luke Acts. So uh, recording is not instructing. Very much so it wasn't a thing in the Old Testament. It's still not a thing in the New Testament. It, Jesus, uh, Luke is going to record some things in Acts. It doesn't mean that this is the way it should always be. It doesn't mean that that's the way we have to do things. It is simply recording it. And you have to be really careful about what he is recording and what he's instructing for us to do likewise. Acts historically has caused problems for people to figure out how do we apply this book to our lives? And we can. It's just You just have to do a little bit of studying. Okay. Um, Luke tried very much so to be historically accurate. And he researched with direct sources. Uh, you see that all throughout. Um, Acts is really interesting because it carries a salvation history from the Old Testament. So we saw, what I mean by salvation history is we saw like Genesis and Exodus and Judges and Samuel. And there's a story going on about God saving his people, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And then it just stops. Well, in Acts, the story resumes. And he picks up back up the, the story of salvation. We see it kind of come to its conclusion in, in, in Luke, and then expands past that in Acts. Uh, it's written to a very very much so a more Greek audience. Uh, Mark was more Roman, but, but Luke feels more Greek. Um, specifically, those who are rich. Once again, we know Theophilus was rich because he funded this project, but the, probably, once again, wasn't only written to him. And obviously, uh, it got uh, circulated throughout the ch- early church, so there's that. Um, it was written for history, yes, but it was also written for apologetics, which is the defense of the, fa- the, fa- the faith. Uh, it was also written for theological reasons, and it was also written for pastoral care. So Luke actually um, is trying to um, trying to give guidance and direction and encouragement and correction to his audience as well. The first half of Acts is, it has a focus on the Jews, and the second half of Acts has a focus on the Gentiles. Um, so the first half is going to focus on Peter because he was kind of the forerunner to the uh, Jews. And then it's going to switch over to Paul, who was kind of the forerunner for the Gentiles. Uh, the church's efforts have to be in response and obedience to Jesus. Where he said, like, for instance, go. We can't get allow ourselves to get, you know, sidetracked for all these different things. And when and, and when 90% of a church's budget just goes to itself, there's a problem. So not, not every bad thing, um, though, is a sign of wrath from God. And this is something we see uh, in Luke Acts, but we really see throughout the whole Bible. Famines and earthquakes mentioned with, actually, with absolutely zero tie-in to how it's related to God's wrath or judgment. Now, every single time that things happen nowadays, there's people on television that tell us it's a sign from God and all these different things. But that historically has not been the position of the church. I mean, you take, for instance... Um, there's, there was this uh, earthquake that happened in the Old Testament, and it just uses it as a reference point. It never once brings it up as a sign of God's judgment. But then there was a locust swarm that came on the land, and then a prophet comes by and says, yes, this was a sign of God's wrath and judgment. So, you know, there are some times when things like that are going to happen, but not every single time that there's fires in California or earthquakes or, or tornadoes up in uh, Oklahoma does this mean that this is a sign uh, of wrath from God. So, well, what does it matter that Luke and Acts is, that we have it? Uh, well, honestly, Luke is probably my favorite other Gospels. Um, maybe maybe Matthew. I don't know. John's, John's really good, too. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's Mark. I don't know. Um, so, well, what does it matter? Well, Jesus came to seek and save the oppressed, and the church's mission is to carry on the master's mission. And as much as that is a huge theme in, in Luke Acts, uh, we oftentimes get off track with that uh, in the modern church, unfortunately. So the next book is Philemon. This is the first of what's called the prison epistles. That that is letters that Paul has written while he's incarcerated. Uh, Which That doesn't look too good as a pastor, huh? Where's your pastor? Oh, he's in prison. (laughs) Uh, We're going to have an evangelist come to our church and and give a sermon. Oh, yeah, tell me about him. Oh, he just got out of prison. Uh, So at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, he was arrested and eventually ended up in Rome for a few years. He'd been in... uh, you know, a couple different places for a few years, and it had taken him a while to be sent there, but he ended up there. 
Uh, and there was a slave owner named Philemon uh, from the church in Colossae, which evidently, or, you know, the Colossians, so Colossae. Uh, and Paul evidently knew this gentleman somehow. I'm not exactly sure how. Uh, but this gentleman, Philemon, had a runaway slave uh, that Paul met while he was in Rome and led him to Christ. He got saved. And so afterwards, this is after the book of Acts, uh, this slave ended up becoming a bishop in Ephesus, according to the church father Ignatius. So Paul met, met, while, met him while he was in Rome, and then he sends this letter to Philemon by the same courier that he sends to deliver uh, the letters of Colossians and Ephesians. And he writes to Philemon and says, hey, uh, can you forgive this man and maybe even set him free? Uh, it was written in about 61. Uh, Paul mentions he intended to go to Colossae, uh, which Philemon is a part of that church, but the book of Philemon is not written to the whole uh, church. Uh, he had earlier intended to go to Spain, is what he said in Rome, in the book of Romans, uh, but his imprisonment had changed things. So he still had Spain on the mind, but he is not sure if he's going to make it there anymore. So well, what does it matter about Philemon? Well, not only are there intense implications for slavery from the book of Philemon, but also Philemon was called before his entire house church to forgive. This book of Philemon wasn't written to Paul, written to Philemon alone. It was written to him and his house church. So uh, he was the one who was wronged, and yet Paul appealed to him to please, please, please forget the forgive the slave and to set him free. And um, and well, the entire house church uh, was witness to that. So talk about the heat being on, huh? So then now he then he wrote a, a, a letter to the entire. Uh, church, which was at, in Colossae, and this is Colossians. Uh, Colossians and Ephesians are both very similar books uh, because they were written at the same time. Uh, I already mentioned this is, the, this is the church that Philemon was a part of. Paul did not found this church. He did not start it. Um, the, this letter was written at the same time as Philemon in 61 while Paul is imprisoned in Rome. It was written to confront a series of heresies involving now buckle up. This gets just as messy as it did in Corinthians. Uh, Judaizers, so people trying to trying to be trying to be saved by faith and works. Hellenizers, or or, or Greeks, people who thought you had to be like the culture. <laughs> uh, spiritualism and philosophy. So there's a lot going on there, and I'm not even going to try in this kind of short. Thing to, to, to look too much at it. But one thing was asceticism, which we looked at earlier. Separation from the world. Spirit good, flesh corrupt. Jesus either wasn't fully God, or he wasn't fully human, but appeared to be. And there's kind of this, this either or, okay? So if Jesus was fully God, the question being how on earth could God have suffered, right? But if he was fully human, how could he have been holy? Because he would have been fleshly. So he wasn't. He couldn't have been holy, fully human. He only appeared to be human, which has serious implications, obviously. Uh, another thing was legalism, salvation by works. Uh, legalism is basically where you try to be good enough. That's a real simple version of, of saying that. Now, now there's also some implications for here for how you're going to treat your body, how you're going to live, and how you're going to see Jesus, right? So if you're indulging in the flesh, for instance, that's going to that's going to have an impact on your lifestyle. You're going to you're going to you're going to overeat, you're going to indulge in, in any sexual immorality. Um you, you're you're not going to take care of your body. You're not going to see exercise as a necessary thing. You're going to get unhealthy and all these different things. Jesus in, in that same 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 way, um you're going to see Jesus uh, not as he actually was, but in light of your uh views, your indulging views. Um you're gonna encourage things. Maybe you're maybe if you're like, for instance, into Judea, uh, the Judaizers, you're gonna believe in the mutilation of the flesh. I mean, there was a period of Christian history where where people would literally whip themselves to, to bleeding, um, and they thought that this was a good thing, uh, which obviously was not. They should have read a book like Colossians, huh? Uh, Paul isn't attacking random actions, but he, necessarily, but he's a, 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 attacking the underlying philosophies that are that are. That are uh, evident in them. So yes, they're doing these things, but what they're doing is based off of their these philosophies that they're um, that they have. So Colossae, the city was destroyed in 62, about a year or two after this letter was written by an earthquake. Uh, so I, I'm uh, evidently there's no evidence that the city was ever rebuilt. Um, I'm guessing that the people 
at least part of them survived and they just moved on? Um, I am, I'm not real sure. Um, so, so what does it matter about Colossians? Well, really, there's a lot of stuff happening in, in the book of Col uh, Colossians. I, wish we, I really wish we had more time to break down those four groups of Judaizers, Hellenizers, spiritualists, and philosophers, but we just don't. Um, so what, uh, what does it matter? Colossians deals very strongly with wrong thinking, which leads to wrong actions, rather than just focusing on the actions. And the last book we're going to look at, oops, we're going to look at uh, in this lesson is, Ephes is, is Ephesians. Ephesus was a port city uh, with wealthy, uh, wealthy leaders and a large occult practice for Artemis or Diana, depending on which, uh, what, what was your background. Uh, it's the same, it's the same goddess basically. Um, but the, the worship of Artemis Diana was, was just huge. Uh, if you read through Acts and it says, "Great is Artemis of the Ephesians," that's that's what they're talking about. Um, so. This is the last of these three books that was written at the same time, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians. So it was written about 61, same time, same courier, sent the same time. Um, it was the, the, the book of Ephesians was actually possibly written to the church at Laodicea. The most of the reliable, the most reliable manuscripts don't have Ephesus in them at all. Um, so there is definitely that possibility. It could have also been used for numerous churches, kind of like a cyclical, where it's just kind of sent around to all the different churches in the area. Uh, Revelation was actually done like that. It was sent to a group of, of uh, churches, not just one. So it could have had the same kind of thing happen there. Um, once again, I'm excluding the very lengthy discussions people have about who wrote the book. Let's just say Paul and move on from there because it's way more complicated and it's just not really worth taking up the entire uh, the entire time. So it differs from, largely in, from Paul's writing style, possibly because he used a different scribe than he normally did, uh, and he probably gave them a little bit more freedom than he normally gave them to uh, write. So Ephesians is probably more of a conglomeration effort, Paul and the scribe. Uh, this letter addresses the battle between the church and the cults, which once again is a very important topic from where they are, and also it's it's getting to be a very time very important topic in the world that we live in today. Uh, very much so cults are on the rise. People are very spiritual, they're just not um, Christian. Uh, there's strong warnings against uh, the strength of the demonic in this book. Sometimes uh, people, especially in the modern world, kind of don't understand that the demonic has power and they kind of mess with things that they probably shouldn't be messing with. Um, in a kind of naive and foolish way. So uh, Ephesians and some uh, some other books, but Ephesians has a, has one of the big ones. Has a very controversial controversial woman passage uh, passage talking about women, uh, which is very much so context driven. Um, which people just once again read it and forget about the context, and hence the problem. Um, the Bible is not sexist. It doesn't have to be. Um, interpreted differently in light of our modern thinking of, of male and female roles. It's something that we have to understand the context and then apply it to our lives today. Um, I wish we could get into that. That's probably a discussion that we'll have in the future, but one we really don't have time for right now. So what does the book of Ephesians really matter? Well, the church continues to wage war against the darkness of the culture, and this message, therefore, remains timeless. Uh, next week, we'll finish up the New Testament. We've read, we've gone through 14 of the books uh, of the New Testament. We looked at Ephesians and how they were dealing with, with a very strong cult presence, uh, a, a cult presence. Uh, we looked at the book of Colossians and how they were dealing with the different, uh, the different worldviews from Judaizers and Hellenizers and spiritualism and philosophy and how that affected the church's outlook. Um, how they had things like asceticism from, from the Hellenizers, where there was a separation from the world, or legalism from the Judaizers about how you did all these things to be good enough, or, you know, all these different things there. Um, and how it, how it very much so had implications for how they treated their bodies and also how they saw Jesus. We looked at the book of Philemon and how uh, Paul argued uh, for the freedom of a slave. We looked at the book of the books of Luke and Acts and how it showed the work of the Holy Spirit in the church and uh, God's uh, desire to see people saved. We looked at the book of Romans and how Jew and Gentile uh, had to come together in the church there. We looked at the book of Corinthians uh, with a very immature but um, charismatic church that had that needed order, very much so needed order. You don't have to have a charismatic, or, it's, it doesn't make it charismatic to not have order, just have things go crazy. We looked at the book uh, books of Thessalonians and how they gave us a, a, a rounded view of 
uh, the return of Jesus. We looked at the book of Galatians and how it how it leaned into the idea of us being free in Christ and how the law of Christ isn't something that we can necessarily pin down. Uh, we looked at the, at the gospel of Mark, how it was the first of the gospels and how it emphasized Jesus as the son of God. We looked at the book of Jude, written by Jesus' brother, and how it talked about false teachers and false teachings. Uh, we looked at the book of James, how it was also written by Jesus' brother, and how it talked about uh, wisdom and um, how we use our mouths and going through trials and how we look and view and deal with uh, the rich and the poor of our uh, cultures and of our church. Uh, and we'll pick up next week, I'm sorry, in two weeks, uh, finishing up our discussion of the New Testament. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.